We end today's show remembering the late poet Maya Angelou. Great souls die, and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon them, upon their nature, upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, seems to fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable silence of dark, cold caves. And then our memory comes to us again in the form of a spirit, and it is the spirit of our beloved. Maya Angelou, the legendary writer and civil rights activist, reading her poem, When Great Trees Fall. This May marks Angelo's one-year death anniversary. Well, we spend the remainder of the hour honoring Angelo through the memories of her friend, the public TV and radio broadcaster, Tavis Smiley. His new book is called My Journey with Maya. It chronicles their nearly three-decade-long multi-generational friendship. He was 21 and she was 58 when they first met in the mid-1980s. The book is brimming with the renowned poet's words and Smiley's remembrances of how she guided him through through challenging moments in his life. The book's release coincides with the U.S. Postal Service's unveiling of a new limited edition forever stamp honoring Maya Angelou. The stamp bears a picture of Maya with the quote, a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer, it sings because it has a song. But the stamp has caused a controversy after it emerged the quotation is apparently not Maya Angelou's. Children's book author Joan Walsh Angland said she wrote it first in a book of poems published in 1967. But she said she didn't mind it was identified with Maya Angelou because she said she hoped that her writing would subliminally affect people and shape children, as she had written it as a children's book. For more, we're joined now by Tavis Smiley, speaking today at the New York Public Library at noon, then at Union Square, Barnes & Noble tonight at 7.30, the book My Journey with Maya, co-written with David Ritz, now being adapted for Broadway by Kenny Leon, the Tony Award-winning director of A Raisin in the Sun. Tavis Smiley, welcome back to Good Democracy to Now. You. Good to be out here as well. Congratulations yeah. on this lovely book. When did you first meet Maya? When I was 21, I was uh, a young aide to Tom Bradley, the late great mayor of my city, Los Angeles. And uh, Dr. Angelo was coming to town for an event. The mayor uh, could not attend the event, and as aides are often uh, assigned to do, uh, I had the great honor of going to present her a letter, uh, a proclamation, and I was literally in her presence for just five minutes, Amy. But in that five minutes, I felt something so powerful and so strong. I vowed to myself at some point in my life, I have got to get myself back into this woman's space. I had no idea that some years later I'd be invited by her to go on a trip to Africa for almost two weeks, and my assignment literally was just to carry her bags. Uh, and for two weeks I carried her bags around Africa, but that didn't stop her uh, from allowing a friendship to blossom. I mean, she was already iconic at that point. Uh, this is in August of 1983, 1993 rather. So in January of 93, she, of course, had delivered that poem at Bill Clinton's first inauguration. So she's already, again, world-renowned. Uh, and I'm just a nobody, but we're hanging out together in Africa for a couple of weeks. And uh, even though that distance between what she had accomplished and what I had yet begun to do was so broad, she enveloped me, she embraced me. Uh, and uh, 28 years later, until she passed away last May, we had a wonderful friendship. Could you explain, you talk about it mm -hmm. uh, very powerfully in the book, the significance of that trip for Maya Angelou to Ghana yeah. and, and also for you. Mm -hmm. She had lived in Ghana earlier in her life. Um, so for her, it was sort of a, a homecoming, and they rolled out the red carpet for, for, for Maya Angelou. Long before I'd ever heard of or met a guy named Barack Obama, I met a black president, an African president of a country called Ghana, whose name was Jerry John Rawlings. We were staying at the presidential palace. So here I am, a 20-something-year-old kid. I'm hanging out with Maya Angelou. I've never left the country before, except maybe going across the bridge from Detroit to Windsor, Canada. <laughs> uh, but I've never left the country. So I'm going to Africa for the first time. I'm out of the country for the first time. I'm going to the motherland. I'm going with Maya Angelou. I'm staying in the presidential palace. I'm meeting the president of Ghana. And Maya is speaking at this international conference. And guess who walks in the room, Amy? Stokely Carmichael. And behind him walks in Miriam Makiba. And then walks in the great historian, John Henry Clark. I'm a 20-year-old kid. I'm taking all this in. 
so it was significant for her, to your brilliant question, because she was going home, as it were, back to a place she had lived prior. But for me, I had run for city council in Los Angeles and lost this race. I know it's hard to imagine. I laugh at it now, but it wasn't so funny then. I'm in my mid-20s. I've run for city council in L.A., and I've lost. But because all I ever wanted to do was to be a public servant, and I make a distinction between being a public servant and a politician. As you know, my hero has been for all of my life, Dr. King. So I thought that public service was my way to express this, 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 um, this gift that I thought I had of loving and serving people. So I wanted to run for public office. I run for city council, and I lose. But because I had no other goals or plans in life but to serve people, I literally didn't know what to do. I was lost. I didn't know what the next step in my life was. I didn't know how to find my own voice. What is my calling in the world? The only thing I think I was ever born to do, I just failed at. What do I do now? It was a very serious and uh, depressing moment for me. And so into that very space steps this uh, invita comes this invitation from my Angelo to go to Africa, and I started this journey of trying to figure out what my role in the world was. So let's go back to Maya yeah. Angelo. In her own words, as she reads one of her most celebrated poems, Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom just because I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room, just like suns and like moons with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh. <laughs> As if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. Does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak miraculously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And so, naturally, there I go rising. Mm -hmm. Maya Angelou, reading from her poem, Still I Rise. And according to uh, The Guardian and BBC, Nelson Mandela recited Still I Rise at his inauguration for president in 1994 in South Africa. I want to go to Maya with Tavis on January 20th, 2009, when Maya Angelou appeared on The Tavis Smiley Show and discussed the inauguration of President Barack Obama, the first African-American president in the country's history. This is Tavis Smiley interviewing Maya Angelou on that historic day. When you say, I can do it, it obviously makes me think of that, that, that phrase that we all know now, etched in our brains, yes, we can, and that yes, we can, of course, courtesy of one Barack Obama. So in a matter of That's hours right. from now, in a matter of hours from now, this country will inaugurate its first African-American president. And what's that grin I see on your face about? <laughs> and look at what we have. <laughs> My Lord. A young, not just a prince. We have a young king. We have a young king who strides into the arena, bringing everyone with him. I admire uh, President-elect Obama. I admire him. I love him with my heart because he sees himself as a, 
American president. Mm. And he means to see our country become more than it is today, more than what James Baldwin called these yet to be United States. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Ah, your dear friend, it's exciting. Your, your dear friend, Jimmy Baldwin. That is Maya Angelou being interviewed by Tavis Smiley on his show. So, Tavis, this was an area that mm -hmm. you and Maya disagreed over mm -hmm. fiercely. Yeah. Talk about your fights and talk particularly about her and your assessment of First President of all, when Obama. I see, when I see that video of, uh, of, of Maya and I talking, I, I, I interviewed her over a dozen times. I mean, imagine I, I started as a kid in Africa trying to figure out what my role in the world is. And over 28 years, she saw me blossom and saw my career unfold. And she ends up being a guest on my programs over a dozen times. And it just, it just, my skin just tingles every time I see myself in conversation with her because I adore her so much. But to your point, we disagreed on a number of things. But the beauty of that is that, you know, she allowed me to interrogate her. She welcomed hearing my opinions and my point of view. She wanted to, to have a contestation of ideas so that both of us could be made better. She started out a strong supporter of Hillary Clinton in 2008, obviously, because she had Arkansas roots. She's from Stamps, Arkansas. Bill Clinton, as we all know, is from a place called Hope. So they are friends from their Arkansas days. So she starts out supporting Hillary. When Barack Obama wins the nomination, she obviously supported Barack Obama. And there were people who thought that my commentary and my questions was were a bit tough on the candidate. People thought that you were a bit tough on the candidate. And that happens in our business when, you know, when we raise questions that, that I think and you believe ought to be raised. These are critical questions that have to be raised. People have to be held accountable. And you don't do it just to the Bushes. You do it to, to the Clintons and you do it to the Obamas. And that's what your role is on this great program. And I celebrate you for that. And that's what my role is. And so Maya Angelou understood that. But when the Obama campaign started sending all of its surrogates after me to try to get me to tone down whatever that means, I guess that means not doing my job, they sent Charles Ogletree, who had been the professor of Barack and Michelle when they were at the Harvard Law School, they sent other people after me to try to get me to tone down. And when none of that worked, apparently, they played their ace card. They had my, my mother, Maya Angelou, call me, <laughs> and we had a serious conversation about Barack Obama. Uh, and she expressed her point of view, and I said to her, this is my calling. When I met you and we hung out 28 years ago in Africa, this is what you were trying to help me figure out, what my place was in the world. I've done this consistently, and I know that you appreciate the fact that this is what I do. Uh, I don't disrespect Barack Obama. I intend to vote for him just like you're going to vote for him. But that doesn't mean that I have to, uh, I, that I should abrogate my responsibility to hold him accountable. She understood it, and that conversation ended, as did every conversation, because there are a number of things in the book you read that we had debates about, about Barack Obama, about the N-word. One of the worst mistakes that I think she ever made, and I love her, was writing that op-ed, Amy, in the New York Times to support Clarence Thomas when he was nominated. We disagreed about that. Uh, we had a long-running debate, lovingly, about what we thought was the greatest of all the virtues. And she asked me one day, what do you think the greatest of all the virtues is? I said, for me, it'd have to be love. She said, no, I, I think it's courage. And for 28 years, we had a debate about which is the greatest of, the, of those virtues, love or courage. We never settled that. Even after she, uh, she died last year, there's still no, no winner, uh, no, no definitive answer to that, that, to, to that debate. But my point is that every difference that we had, Amy, always ended on a love note. She never allowed any conversation, no matter how tense or terse, to end on anything but a love note. And our friendship always remained intact. Well, Tavis Smiley, want to thank you so much thank for you. being with us. Tavis Smiley, a journalist, public TV and radio broadcaster. His new book is called My Journey with Maya. He's speaking today at the New York Public Library at noon and at Union Square, Barnes & Noble at 7.30. This is Democracy Now! If you'd like to get a copy, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Aaron Mate, Nermeen Sheikh, Steve Martinez, Sam Malkoff, Hani Masood, Robbie Karen, Dina Guzder, Amy Littlefield, Anna Ozbeck, Sam Riddell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nogueira, our engineers. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Hugh Grant, Jessica Lee, David Frude, Vesta Godars, and to our camera crew, John Randolph and Kieran Krug Meadows and Jose Miranda. Our website is democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea.